Hello and welcome to another video from the only channel that you need to not only survive the current apocalypse but actually enjoy it. And today's video is going to address a very odd group of scriptures seemingly about the use of blood. At Acts chapter 15 and verse 20, the Bible records that the apostles and elders of the first century Christian community wrote to the congregations to abstain from things polluted by idols from sexual immorality, from what is strangled, and from blood. I often tell people that if a Bible verse seems strange or out of place or seems to contradict other Bible verses, it is probably because of a problem with the translation. And as I am about to explain, that is what is going on with these scriptures as well. I have as of yet never found a single Bible verse as it is presented in the original languages that contradicts any other verse. This is going to be a very long video and much of the information that I am going to present is going to seem unrelated to the subject matter, but I promise that if you stay with me to the end, you will have a very clear understanding of the importance of blood as it relates to the Bible. You will hear things here that you will never hear in a church. God does not reveal truth through any of the empire's religions. All so-called Bible-based religions are in reality based not on the Bible as a whole, but instead on these awkward, out-of-place scriptures. I personally do not participate in any religion in any way, but respect the decision of others as to how to please their God or gods. The true God freely gives his love to all of us. Therefore, I feel compelled to put forth great effort towards showing my appreciation for that love by my actions. It frustrates me any time that anyone hinders my attempts at doing so. God's love permeates all of creation, so it is obvious that I would not be the only one that would recognize that love. It stands to reason that others would want the freedom to show their appreciation for that love as well. I treat others as I wish to be treated myself and do not infringe on anyone's attempts at showing such appreciation to their God or gods just as I do. If a person's religion causes them to harm themselves, I believe that is their right. If a person's religion causes harm to others, there is nothing that I can do about that. Satan's authority to rule the world was granted by God. It is God that will soon take that authority away. In the meantime, Satan has in place a governmental hierarchy designed to at least on some level protect his citizens. Where that system fails is none of my concern. That being said, a very large part of my devotion to my God or my efforts to tell everyone alive on the earth today all about what is recorded in his word, the Bible. I love the incredible, powerful truths held within its pages and hate with a very deep passion anything that Satan or his followers do to make my God seem evil, arbitrary, or foolish by misrepresenting, misinterpreting, or mistranslating the scriptures. I don't like it when the churches lie about the Bible, but those kinds of lies are easy to overcome by anyone willing to simply walk away from civilization's religions, pick up a Bible, and read it for themselves. But when the churches alter the actual words of the Bible through the translation process, uncovering the truth becomes much more difficult. Fortunately for us, many ancient texts from which our English Bibles were supposedly translated are still in existence, and in many cases, available for study on the internet. Even still, most people simply do not have the time to meticulously search through thousands of pages of dictionaries, lexicons, and concordances to uncover whether or not a particular passage has been manipulated by Satan's religious establishment. No support for any doctrinal belief of any religion has ever been found anywhere in any ancient text of God's Word. All such passages that exist in our modern English translations are recent additions, meaning that they were either added or altered after the eyewitnesses of those events had died. In the very earliest part of the Bible, God prophesied that if humans stop being obedient to his law, what we refer to as natural law, death would be the result. It is God that will put an end to the sadness, pain, and suffering associated with death. Not me or you, 
It is not within our power to do so. However, we do have the power to help people to free themselves from religion by exposing the lies on which those religions are based. As the Bible says, the truth can set people free, but truth can't do anything for anybody unless it is revealed. There can be no doubt that many who watch this video will be uncomfortable with the information that I am going to present. It is not my goal to make anyone uncomfortable, but there is simply no way around exposing lies if we wish to share the truth. Speaking truth by default requires exposing Satan and his religions for what they are. When people harm plants, trees, fish, birds, animals, and one another, it makes me very sad. Under Satan's rule, we are supposed to be sad and frustrated and scared. That's the whole point of allowing humanity the freedom to choose which god or gods to be obedient to. If you feel that Satan's civilization was forced upon you against your will, just try to keep in mind the words of Hebrews chapter 5, and verses 7 through 10, which say that we all need to learn obedience through the things that we are suffering, just as Jesus learned obedience from the things that he suffered. The point being that even Jesus had to learn obedience. That being the case, who of us can say that we do not? As I always like to remind people, the Bible is not some kind of rule book for how to get to heaven, but is in fact a written record of the war between God's kingdom and Satan's empire. Understanding what has happened over the course of human history as well as why can strengthen our faith in what the Bible says will shortly take place as this war draws to its conclusion. Most people have invested all of their faith in the empire's ability to provide for their needs. Witnessing the decay of civilization and recognizing its eminent collapse has those people shuddering. But for those of us who recognize that Satan's empire was doomed to failure from the beginning, witnessing that collapse with our own eyes is marvelous beyond compare. We're about to experience things that for thousands of years the prophets could only dream about. As a way of life, civilization has never been able to provide for the needs of mankind. Most of the empire's citizens have been fooled into believing that competing over control of the Earth's resources is somehow more just than simply sharing those resources equally. This method of lording it over humanity is often referred to by Satan's servants as the economy, and the damage inflicted by the system is spoken of as progress. Every human that has ever lived has seen for themselves that Satan's system of governance does not, cannot, and will not ever work. But as the old saying goes, in for a penny, in for a pound. No one wants to admit to themselves that everything that they have ever done in support of human society was a waste. The Apostle Paul called his own lifetime investment in the system garbage. Having been given the opportunity to try out civilization, many of us have come to the conclusion that living according to natural law as God originally intended would be better than the situation that we find ourselves in currently. That is why Satan has created so many conflicting versions of religion. Were it not for the support of religion, civilization would be rendered impotent. Without some kind of well-respected, solidly established propaganda system in place, no one would be willing to live like this. At our foundation, we are spiritual beings. There is no way that we would ever, on our own, come to the conclusion that from the beginning, God intended for us to be dominated by any kind of hierarchical pyramid scheme. All religions, earthwide, Hold out hope that through a legal covenant with God, civilization can be fixed or in some cases replaced with a better version of civilization, more in line with the laws of their particular God or gods. Ensuring that the religions of civilization perform their assigned task as necessary is a very powerful secret society known as the Freemasons. In the Bible, this organization is called the Builders. 
the name that the builders have given to this utopian version of civilization is the new world order. As ridiculous as this scheme may sound to spiritual men and women, the belief that such a thing can actually work is very strong within the ranks of civilization's religious organizations. You will rarely, if ever, find a religious person that is willing to talk about civilization in a negative way. In fact, within the religions of the empire, rebellion against human society's established norms is frowned upon. This despite the fact that the Bible clearly states that God does not accept any religion that is part of civilization. The Bible gives us hope by keeping us informed about what has happened over the course of human history and what will soon take place. Many of religion's adherents will be so frightened by what they witness when the last days begin that they will not know what to do. The resulting uprising will be the greatest bloodbath in all of human history. Every blood sacrifice recorded in the Bible has been an acknowledgement of this coming battle. Blood is the subject of many Bible passages. Comparing the information in those passages can help us to understand why the subject of blood is such a big issue within the Bible narrative. All scriptures about blood are closely related. Whether those scriptures are about animal sacrifices, ritual human sacrifice, carnal warfare, the sacrifice of Jesus, or the unprecedented human sacrifice that will soon take place at Armageddon. When Cain and Abel wanted to be accepted by God, they each made sacrifices to him. Cain sacrificed some agricultural products and was denied entry. Abel, on the other hand, offered up a blood sacrifice of some of the firstlings of his flock, and God approved. The original language word translated as firstlings in this verse is bekaura, which comes from the word bekaur, meaning birthright or rightful heir. Referring to animals as firstborn or rightful heirs would be accurate according to the creation account. The animals were put here first. According to the Bible, God's firstborn was Jesus, giving him the birthright or making him the rightful heir. Abel's sacrifice of his firstlings, followed by the sacrifice of his own life, prefigured the sacrifice of God's own son. But even more important, Abel's sacrifice prefigured every human death that has ever taken place or will take place before God's kingdom can be firmly established. According to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24, the blood sacrifice of Jesus was superior to the blood sacrifice made by Abel and for many reasons, not the least of which is the fact that even though animals were created before man, Jesus was created before the animals. In fact, Jesus was created for Satan and his angels. Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 16 explains this concept. It is important to understand that Cain and Abel were both trying to accomplish the same thing, only in different ways. They were both trying, as the Bible says, to gain entry. At the time, the only place on earth where humans were not allowed entry was the paradise of pleasure, what our English translations of the Bible call the Garden of Eden. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that God enjoys bloodshed. In fact, anyone reading the Bible would be able to quickly determine that exactly the opposite is true. Bloodshed would not be compatible with basic Bible concepts such as dress and keep the garden, love thy neighbor, and thou shalt not kill. Having so many passages in the Bible about shedding blood for a God that hates bloodshed should make it obvious that this information has been recorded in order to communicate something much more substantial than simply how to appease a bloodthirsty God. The last book in the Bible says that very soon all pain and suffering will be done away with, and when this takes place, we will all gain entry into a paradise of pleasure exactly like the one that our original parents lost. The trees of life will be restored, the waters of life will be restored, 
and every human that has ever died will be restored. I cannot overstate the importance of grasping this basic concept. The sacrifice that Abel made in order to gain temporary entry into the Garden of Eden, as well as the sacrifice of his own life, which gained him an eventual eternal, permanent entry into God's future paradise of pleasure, are representative of every death that has ever taken place or will take place under civilization's mismanagement of our Father's creation. And not just human deaths, but also the deaths of every living creature that we were put here to look after. Abel's blood sacrifice was pleasing to God because it accurately represented the unavoidable results of any version of law in opposition to God's law, what we today call natural law. According to the Bible, as messengers, angels were given oversight of mankind, and mankind was given oversight of the birds, fish, and land animals allowing us the freedom to ignore God's law while carrying out that responsibility is nothing more than part of the learning process that we all have to endure. Currently, we do not have the option of living by natural law. Satan's empire has a system of well-established, brutally enforced, unnatural laws in place, making natural law illegal. But the Bible promises that once Christ returns, natural law will be reestablished as the only acceptable way to live, making all unnatural laws illegal. When that takes place, the learning process will be over. Anyone attempting to reestablish any version of civilization will be done away with forever. Jesus' death paid the ransom for everyone. Because of his sacrifice, we were all freed from bondage to religion. That is why Jesus could tell the Pharisees that the kingdom would not be coming future tense in any way that would be observable with the eyes, because the kingdom was within them. As the spiritual leaders of the Promised Land at that time, they could have chosen to take a stand on the side of God's kingdom. After all, God had at one time entered into a covenant with the nation of Israel, promising to support their religion as long as they themselves adhered to the precepts of that religion, something that God had never done with any other nation before and has never done since. Even so, they continued to support Satan's empire at every juncture. It was this stand taken by religion against God's kingdom that freed mankind from religion. As the Bible says, Jesus fulfilled the law. The fact that the only religion on earth that God ever gave his blessing to was instrumental in the torture and death of his own son should make it obvious to everyone that religion is, always has been, and will continue to be God's enemy all the way to the end. The stand that the religious leaders took in Jesus' day just like the stand that the empire's religions are taking in our day is sufficient proof that mankind will never be able to gain God's approval through any system of worship. When Abel sacrificed, the firstborn, or rightful heirs, what our Bibles call his firstlings, he was prophetically doing what the citizens of Satan's civilization would do years later when they sacrificed Jehovah's firstborn, or rightful heir, Jesus, whom the Bible calls the Lamb of God, Jehovah's firstling. Later, when Cain murdered Abel, he was prophetically doing what Satan's citizens will do in the very near future, on the great and fear-inspiring day of the Lord, also known as Armageddon. When the citizens of Satan's empire are finished murdering one another, all of mankind will gain permanent entry into God's kingdom the restored paradise of pleasure. With this final ritual human sacrifice, religion, having served its purpose, will be done away with forever. Not only will Armageddon free the living from the oppressive reign of civilization, but even those held captive by Sheol, the realm of the dead, will be freed. When Christ returns, there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. After God's chosen one does away with Satan and his system of dominating humanity, there will be no more tolerance 
for anyone attempting to institute any kind of hierarchical social construct. Should any insist on making the attempt, there will be what the Bible calls the second death. Cain's sacrifice of agricultural products was not acceptable to God because our father knew that Cain's attempts at fixing the earth through his own efforts would not work. Cain made the same mistake that his mother had made previously by believing that he could be like God, knowing good and bad. God created everything on this planet in such a way as to provide humanity with an unending pleasure. None of the alterations made by mankind have ever increased that pleasure. When Satan promised Eve that she could have the knowledge of good and bad, he was lying. Only the Creator can know what is good and what is bad for creation. Our God has instilled in us an instinctive desire, knowledge, and physical ability to enjoy creation, but not the knowledge or ability to alter that creation in any way that would be beneficial. Only the one that created the earth can know what is good and what is bad. For the earth. When Jesus told us to pray for God's kingdom to come on earth as in heaven, the kingdom that he was speaking of was that restored paradise of pleasure. In God's eyes, every murder, every combat casualty, every genocide, every industrial accident, every transportation death, every bloodletting that has ever taken place has been nothing more than a senseless ritual human sacrifice. What's more, every death attributed to so-called natural causes such as old age and sickness has in God's eyes been considered as ritual human sacrifice as well. These two kinds of death, death involving bloodletting and death not involving bloodletting, are both acknowledged throughout the scriptures. When Satan offered Eve the opportunity to improve upon God's creation, she had no point of reference. She had never lived anywhere except for the paradise of pleasure. There is nothing to suggest that she desired better living conditions, but just like everybody who has ever lived, she understood that better is better. So she obviously, obviously took Satan at his word when he told her that she could be like God, knowing good and bad. Since Jesus called Satan the father of lying, she would also have had no point of reference in regard to lying. She probably did not even understand that lying was possible. When Eve chose to partake of the fruit that Satan was offering her, she entered into what our Bibles call a covenant. A covenant is simply a two-way binding agreement between two individual entities. Those entities can be two individuals, as in the covenant between Satan and Eve or every other marriage agreement, between one individual and a nation of individuals, such as the covenant between God and the ancient nation of Israel, or between two or more nations, as in every alliance form to create every empire spoken of throughout the Bible, including the current empire that rules over the earth today. Many of us recognize that God's natural law is the only law that can work, and as such, avoid the legalism of covenants as much as possible. We, as spiritual beings, recognize that the legalism of covenant law cannot, does not, and will not improve our lot in life. Unlike Eve, we know how to recognize lies. Writing lies on paper and getting signatures on those paper does not have the power to change those lies into truth. That does not mean that people who refuse to enter into such agreements are not affected by the covenants that exist between others. It should be obvious that Eve's covenant with Satan has had a very profound effect on each and every person that has ever lived. The covenants that exist within and between the nations today are nothing more than a continuation of that original covenant between Satan and Eve. It does not matter how many laws and bylaws are added to the covenant, no matter how many exclusions and additions are attached to the covenant, no matter how many billions of pages of signed legal documents are inserted into the library of legalism, irregardless of how many times this planet of lawyers tweaks the covenant, it will always be inferior to God's natural law. 
it will always be harmful it will always lead to death in Genesis God warned Adam and Eve that if they partook of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and bad that they would die and that is exactly what happened neither of our original parents are with us today the first death recorded in the Bible is that of Abel even though he was willing to submit to God's natural law he still died as a result of mankind's unnatural covenant with Satan being born into a world ruled by covenant law doomed Abel just as it dooms all of us a very important part of the covenant that Eve entered into with Satan was the promise that she would never die the God of Eve's religion is the same God of today's religions and just like back in Eve's day he is still holding out the promise of everlasting life as a reward for anyone voluntarily entering into any number of covenants offered by the thousands of religions under his control in the Bible God calls religion the covenant with death Abel died as a result of bloodshed from the moment of his death all references to blood in the Bible are direct references to death at Genesis chapter 4 and verse 10 God did not tell Cain you are a murderer he told him that he could hear the voice of his brother's blood coming out of the earth this verse is from the Old Testament as translated from Hebrew the two words translated as blood the Hebrew word Dom in the Old Testament and the Greek word Hayama in the New Testament have meanings similar to our word blood but within the within the pages of the Bible every scripture about blood is always related to death we can confirm this at Matthew chapter 23 beginning in verse 1 <clears throat> Jesus gives an entire speech about the wickedness of religious law and concludes by telling those religious leaders to complete the work of murdering good people begun by their father at verse 35 Jesus says upon you may come the blood of every righteous person from Abel to Zechariah son of Berechiah make a note of the fact that Jesus did not actually use the Greek words for murder or death he literally accused those religious leaders of Hama Hama being the Greek word that we translate as blood in this verse the word father is used as we often use it ourselves in English Jesus was not telling the Jews to continue the work of their fleshly fathers or even of father Abraham he was speaking of their founding father the founder of religion neither their fathers according to the flesh nor father Abraham were around when Abel was sacrificed and those Pharisees who have long since died will not be around when Zechariah son of Berechiah is sacrificed in our day in our English Bibles we're made to believe that Zechariah son of Berechiah was someone that Jesus listeners were familiar with as if Jesus was speaking of some first century current event but in the original languages what is actually said is that they will be held accountable future tense as in an event that had not yet taken place when debating over who Zechariah son of Berechiah is Bible scholars suggest that Jesus was misquoted or because of some scribal error the text was corrupted there is no mention of anybody named Zechariah son of Berechiah anywhere else in the Bible or even outside of the Bible being killed anywhere near the temple the book of Zechariah claims to have been written by Zechariah son of Berechiah but then Ezra later calls him Zechariah son of Edo it is possible that these words are not the proper names of his father but instead descriptive nouns related to Zechariah's reputation it is understood and rightfully so that if someone by this name had actually been slaughtered in the temple someone somewhere would have likely recorded an account of this event chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews speaks of Abel and compares him to many other people that had similar faith and yet there is no mention of anybody named Zechariah Jesus spoke of this yet future event in such a way as to leave no room for error that he was condemning all religion from the beginning of human history to the day when he returns to put an end to religion forever 
He did not say that Zechariah, son of Berechiah, was killed between the altar and the temple. Such a thing would not be possible, and the altar that the Jewish leaders were familiar with was in the temple. Someone could have been killed near the altar in the temple, but not between the altar and the temple. The argument has been made that in this verse, the temple that is referred to is actually the sanctuary, which would have been a separate structure within the temple complex. But it must be understood that the word that is translated as temple here in this verse is never used in the Bible when referring to the sanctuary. Luke spoke of this incident as well, but in his account, Zechariah was killed between the altar and the house, the house being the house of God, which could be a reference to the sanctuary. In any case, there is more than enough ambiguity to make it impossible to identify who Jesus was speaking of if he was speaking of an actual individual at all. Zechariah means loved by Jehovah. Barakiah means blessed by Jehovah. Hence, a more accurate rendering into the English language of what Jesus was most likely communicating to the religious leaders that he was speaking to would be, you will be held responsible for all righteous bloodshed from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of everyone loved by Jehovah and blessed by Jehovah. All blood guilt will be shared equally between the altars and the temples. Obviously, since Jesus was accusing the religious leaders that he was speaking to of causing every murder that had ever been committed and every murder that ever would be committed, he could not possibly have been condemning just that small group of religious leaders or even all of the religious leaders of that one religion. The Jewish religion that was being practiced in Judea when Jesus was alive only existed for a very short period of time and only in a very small part of the earth. None of the versions of Judaism that exist in our day have much in common with the version of Judaism that existed in Jesus' day. The religion practiced by the sons of Israel when they were in Egypt would have been distinctly different from the religion given to them by Moses, who did not deliver the Jewish law code to the nation of Israel until thousands of years after Abel was slaughtered. Jesus was born as a Jew raised as a Jew and executed by the Jews in order to fulfill Bible prophecy, nothing else. When Jesus returns, he will rid the earth of religion forever. He will show no favoritism. Certainly, he won't be showing any favoritism to any version of religion claiming to be descended from the religion that had him tortured to death. All religions are based on a system of rules designed to replace natural law. But as Jesus pointed out, they share other character traits as well. When he told the religious leaders of his day to continue doing the work of their father, he made no qualms as to who their father was. At verse 33, he specifically called them snakes and children of the serpent. In the book of John at chapter 8 and verse 44, in a separate incident, he specifically told those same religious leaders that their father was the devil, calling him the father of lying. Every one of these quotes of Jesus are direct references to the original covenant offered to Eve by Satan. The God that Eve entered into her covenant with was the same God that the Pharisees had entered into their covenant with. When Jehovah completed his work of creating, he rested from that work. Everything that was necessary for his paradise of pleasure was in place. Nothing else needed to be done. From that moment on, all of creation could enter into that rest as well. There were no legal agreements, only natural law, a law that every living thing would agree to by instinct. When the first human pair entered into their covenant with the serpent, life did not get better for Eve or her mate as she had been promised. Satan, in a very conspicuous way, was proven very early on to be a liar. Bloodshed quickly became a fact of everyday life. The very first murder was not committed as punishment for doing something wrong, but specifically for doing what was right. This pattern continues to our day. 
The vast majority of murders committed by the empire are not against other empires, but against the indigenous peoples of the world, not because of any wickedness on their part, but simply for their lack of participation in civilization's systems. For the first 2,000 years of human history, the Bible never recorded anything about any formal two-way agreement between any human and the true God. The first such covenant was with Noah. Jehovah asked Noah to build an ark for the preservation of life, something that would not be at all instinctive. In return, Noah and his family survived the single greatest catastrophe in all of human history and were given permission to eat the flesh of animals. When Noah and his family exited the ark, they made a blood sacrifice similar to the sacrifice made by Abel years earlier. As the years went on, Jehovah entered into unique covenants with other righteous men, and in each case, blood was used to confirm the covenant. And each detail that was added to those individual covenants was recorded in the Bible in order to clarify our own understanding of the significance of blood as it relates to God's requirements for us today. When Abraham entered into the promised land, he, like Abel and Noah, made animal sacrifices, one as he approached the promised land and one at the point of entry. Later, Jehovah asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. Abraham willingly complied because he recognized the fact that God could resurrect him. Just before sacrificing Isaac, Jehovah stopped him and provided a ram as a substitute. As time went on, Abraham's offspring grew in numbers and became part of the slave labor force of the Egyptian empire. Jehovah sent Moses to act as his representative and to lead those slaves in a journey from Egypt to the land of Canaan. As part of the process, Jehovah turned the Nile into blood. The Israelites performed blood sacrifices and spattered the entries of their homes with the blood of those sacrifices. The Egyptians did not make sacrifices or put blood on their doorways, and as a result, every firstborn of every house died. God had allowed Israel to sacrifice lambs in place of their children, much as he had allowed Abraham to sacrifice a ram in place of Isaac. The first thing that those Israelites did at the beginning of their journey to the Promised Land was to pass through those doorways spattered with blood. When they passed through those doorways, they were leaving Egypt to, in effect, enter into a new world, similar to Noah and his family when they passed through the doorway of the ark into the earth cleansed by the flood. Noah's sacrifices, Abraham's sacrifices, and the Passover sacrifices all represented the same thing, the experience of death that would be required before mankind could enter into paradise. Initially, the God of Israel offered the newly formed nation the opportunity to once again live under natural law, just as in the case of Adam and Eve thousands of years earlier. They spent over three years in the wilderness putting God to the test, but eventually God commanded Moses to ascend Mount Sinai in order to give him two stone tablets with an enumeration of God's natural law carved into them. But before Moses could descend Mount Sinai, the nation made a golden calf in order to worship it. The two stone tablets that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai are what we today know of as the Ten Commandments. A very important detail about those two tablets is that they were carved directly by the finger of God. When Mo Moses saw that the people were engaged in breaking natural law, he broke those two stone tablets. Moses returned to retrieve what the Bible calls a new covenant, a religious law. But before doing so, he had to establish a religious priesthood to administer that law. At Exodus chapter 32 and verse 26, Moses cried out, Whoever is for Jehovah, come to me. And the sons of Levi eagerly volunteered. Moses instructed them to each perform one ritual human sacrifice, and about 3,000 of them did so. When they returned, Moses declared, Today you have been ordained for service to Jehovah because each of you willingly killed his sons and brothers in order to receive this blessing. The people wanted religion, and Jehovah was giving it to them, complete with ritual human sacrifice. 
Many churches teach that the Levites were sent out to kill those who participated in false worship during the time that Moses spent on Mount Sinai, but there is no scriptural support for this church teaching. The surrounding verses indicate that the entire nation was participating. In fact, at verse 35, the Bible clearly states that Jehovah would personally strike down those engaging in worshiping the golden calf later. And Jehovah, true to his word, did so. Everyone involved died in the wilderness before reaching the promised land. A huge difference between the first law that Moses received from God and the second law is the fact that the second set of tablets would not be written by the finger of God but would be hand carved by Moses himself. And along with the original ten, the nation would come to have hundreds of other laws. These laws were referred to as the law and the covenant. Jesus would later refer to this law not as the law of God, but as the law of Moses. Ezekiel chapter 20 verses 19 through 25 refers to the Ten Commandments as my law and refers to all of the other laws as the wicked law. But verse 26 speaks of one particularly disgusting law that God hated in a unique way. The law that required each family to sacrifice its firstborn. If you read through every law given to the nation of Israel, you will find no such law anywhere in the Bible. And yet many Israelites did in fact participate in ritual human sacrifice on many occasions just as the Levites had at Mount Sinai. In one instance, a man named Jephthah, who was one of the judges of Israel, promised that if he was victorious in battle against the Ammonites, he would perform a ritual human sacrifice of the first person that he met on his return to his homeland. After being victorious, as approaching his tribal home, his only daughter came out to greet him dancing and playing the tambourine. Most argue over whether or not this was an actual sacrifice or if it was instead just an idiomatic phrase related to dedicating someone to sacred service or some other such thing. But the wording of this passage at Judges chapter 11 and verse 31 says, I will offer them up as a burnt offering, literally as a hola, which is where we get our word holocaust. This word is used throughout the Bible and is only used in connection with the animal sacrifices required by the law of Moses. In many of those verses, descriptions are given about how to divide the body parts and internal organs, which parts were to be burned up and in what sequence. There is nothing anywhere in the Bible to indicate that the word hola could be used in any figurative sense. It should be obvious that no animal ever survived the experience of being used as a burnt offering, and neither did Jephthah's daughter. The fact that Jephthah vowed to perform a ritual human sacrifice, as well as his daughter's willingness to submit to the sacrifice, is a pretty good indication that such sacrifices were an accepted part of the culture at that time. Years later, at 1 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 11, and even later in the New Testament at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 32, Jephthah is spoken of as a man to be admired for his faith. This is based at least in part on his willingness to keep his vow. Although it is true that Jephthah murdered his daughter, that doesn't mean that God approves of murder. Verses such as Jeremiah chapter 19 and verse 5 and Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 3 make it very clear that such sacrifices were disgusting to God. Committing murder for God as part of a religious ritual does not change the fact that such rituals are wrong, whether the victim is an animal or a human. Most people just seem to pass over these verses, but they highlight an important aspect of the law, not just the law of Moses, but all religious law, all economic law, and all governmental law of all people everywhere. All law comes from God. Whether he approves of the law or not, whether he dictates the law or not, God created angels and God created humans. So by default, any law created by angels or humans can be traced back to the creator of those angels and humans. Even when the people were worshiping the golden calf, 
and offering their children to Moloch, they in effect were practicing a law given to man by God, just as Ezekiel chapter 20 and verses 19 through 25 says. The law of Moses, although not requiring the citizens of that nation to sacrifice their children, did include laws related to such sacrifices, what might be thought of as a religious loophole. Instead of offering up their children, they could dedicate their children to God and offer up animal sacrifices in their place, similar to the arrangement that God had previously made with Abraham and later at the first Passover. Jehovah's angel killed every firstborn or rightful heir in Egypt with the exception of those protected by the blood of the sacrificial lambs. Leviticus chapter 12 describes how the continuation of this dedication ritual was to be conducted, in particular if the firstborn was a boy. The mother was to be unclean for seven days, and on the eighth day she was to bring her son to the priest, and the flesh of his foreskin was to be circumcised. Then she would continue in the blood of her purifying for 33 days. This would come out to a total of 40 days, a time period equal to the time that the Israelites spent sinning while Moses was on Mount Sinai, after which she would be required to bring in a lamb and a turtle dove for sacrifices. But if she was poor, she would only be required to bring in two turtle doves. The instructions for this were very specific. There would be a circumcision after which the lamb would be sacrificed by bloodletting and then burned while the turtle dove or turtle doves were to be sacrificed without shedding blood. When Jesus was born, the law of Moses was still in effect. Jesus' mother, as a citizen of the nation of Israel, would have been bound by this law. As such, she, sub she submitted to it. At the dedication of Jesus, the Bible records that she sacrificed two turtle doves, indicating that she was poor. These turtle doves would have been sacrificed without shedding blood. The name of such a sacrifice in the Greek language at the time would have been niktos, which means bloodless sacrifice. Had she been prosperous, she would have had to have provided a lamb as a blood sacrifice. In Greek, this word would have been haima. Haima can be translated as blood, bloodshed, bloodletting, or as in this case, blood sacrifice. It must be understood that how this word haima is just translated into English is dependent on the context of the verse and cannot simply be translated according to whatever best suits the religious doctrines of the translator. In the command to abstain from blood, as found at Acts chapter 15 and verse 20 in our English translations of the Bible, these two Greek words, niktos and haima, are both used. When the apostles came together to write to the congregations, they were addressing a very specific problem and doing so in such a way as to leave no margin for interpretation. The word haima, which could be translated as blood, bloodshed, bloodletting, or blood sacrifice in this verse would have to be translated according to the context of that letter as written in the original Greek text as read by those Greek-speaking peoples living at that time. There would have been no doubt as to exactly what the words in that letter were all about. When Jesus traveled about teaching the good news of the kingdom, he did so primarily to the Jews. This being the case, all early followers of Jesus would have by default been Jews. They would have all shared similar backgrounds, customs and dietary habits. They would also have been similar to one another in physical appearance. Part of what would have set them apart from non-Jews, at least for the men, would have been the circumcision. At the time, the social requirements to wear clothing would not have been the same as our current social requirements. 2,000 years ago, clothing would have been very expensive and very difficult to produce. Clothing would not have been worn by men engaged in hard physical labor. Add to that the fact that bathing would have been in public, and it becomes obvious that it would have been very difficult, if not impossible, for a man to hide whether or not he was circumcised. 
some amount of time would have passed before the first non-Jews started associating with the followers of Jesus. It is understandable that initially seeing uncircumcised men associating with those Jewish followers of Jesus would have been unsettling to those who had spent their whole lives as Jews. Prior to the nation being carried off into captivity by the Babylonians, God himself sent prophets to declare that his covenant with the Jewish nation was no longer in effect. Many argue that God's covenant with the nation was forever, and there are scriptures that refer to that covenant as an everlasting covenant. But if we take into consideration that the word covenant means two-way legally binding agreement, it should be more than obvious that a covenant can be broken by either party involved in such an agreement. God had promised that he would care for all of the needs of the nation of Israel as long as they were obedient to the unnatural religious law code that they chose when they rejected God's natural law. God always kept his end of the agreement, never once going back on his word. But the nation that he was in the covenant with quickly developed a reputation as a nation of liars, just like every other nation that has ever existed from the founding of civilization. It was Israel that broke the covenant, not God. In any case, the outcome was the same. The covenant had come to an end, and along with it, all of the laws associated with the covenant, including the laws associated with circumcision. Being freed from their covenant with the true God, Israel once again found itself enslaved to Satan's empire, just as it had been all those years earlier back in Egypt. During their time in the covenant with God, the Egyptian Empire had fallen and been replaced by the Assyrian Empire, which would eventually be in turn replaced by the Greek Empire. When Israel's covenant with God ended, the very first covenant relationship that it entered into was with Babylon, becoming a subordinate territory of the Babylonian Empire. From the moment that Israel entered into that covenant, all prophecies regarding Babylon as recorded in the Bible are direct references to Israel, Jerusalem, Eve's covenant with Satan, and religion in general. All empires rise and fall, and when Babylon fell, Israel once again found itself being forced into other covenant relationships with each of the ascending empires. In chronological order, its ownership was handed over to the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the British Empire, and finally the U.S. Empire. Currently, Israel is once again considered to be a sovereign nation, and in the very near future, it itself will replace the current ruling world empire as Satan moves his throne to Jerusalem. This process has already commenced. Many key government positions within the realm of the Anglo-American Empire are currently held not by citizens of those nations, but by citizens of Israel. This political insanity is in fulfillment of Bible prophecy. This is not typical conspiracy theorist gobbledygook. This is simply the in-your-face, nonsensical reality that we find ourselves confronting. My response to anyone demanding evidence to back up what I just said will simply be, Google it. I am too busy with sustenance and covering to take on the added responsibility of teaching the twisted, perverted, demonic history of world politics. Even though circumcision was not required by any of the empires which governed the former promised land, circumcision was so ingrained in the Jewish culture that most still continued to observe the practice. Law or no law, non-compliance would still carry severe penalties. In any case, once Israel left the covenant, God made it clear that he would never enter into a covenant with Israel again. In fact, Jehovah called the conclusion of that covenant agreement a divorce and according to that very same covenant law divorce was permanent remarriage under the mosaic law was illegal hundreds of years later jesus himself would confirm this on multiple occasions 
But even though it should have been obvious that things such as the circumcision were disgusting to God, the early Christians were so bound by the same social norms as the rest of the nation that they could not imagine a time when Christians would not be circumcised. It is difficult for people to accept change, even when it is for the better. It was actually God himself that let it be known to the early Christian congregations on several occasions that the Jewish law code was no longer in effect in the matter of dietary law. Peter in vision was told that all Jewish dietary laws were done away with, meaning that all things that had previously been declared unclean would now be clean. That included the restrictions on meat from unclean animals, as well as animals that had not been properly bled, animals that had not been sacrificed by a priest, and even the blood of animals, whether clean or unclean. Peter should have understood this because while Jesus was still alive, he himself had specifically declared all foods to be clean. But Peter's vision had broader implications. He understood that without the restrictions of the Jewish law code, he was free to bring non-Jews into the congregation. This meant that from that point on, people of the surrounding nations could be accepted into the congregation people that had not participated in the Jewish rituals, people that did not abide by the law of Moses, people that did not eat a kosher diet, and even the people that did not practice circumcision. The way that God confirmed what Peter already knew was even more obvious. Immediately after declaring all foods clean to Peter, he sent him to the home of a man that was not circumcised. While discussing with the crowd at the man's house how God had not previously shown mercy to non-Jews, but how Jesus' death was for the forgiveness of the sins of everyone, whether they were a Jew or not, something miraculous happened. The Holy Spirit came down on everyone in the house, and they all began to speak in tongues. Peter declared that there was no way for anyone to stand in the way of accepting these uncircumcised people since God had shown that they were acceptable by bestowing the same miraculous gifts on them that he had previously bestowed on the Jewish apostles and disciples. And as unacceptable to the Jews as uncircumcised men were, there was a class of men that were equally, if not more, unacceptable, eunuchs. A eunuch, by definition, would be any man with sexual organs that had been removed, crushed, or altered in any way that would de debilitate them. According to Jewish law, such a man would not be acceptable, irregardless of any procedure he might choose to undergo. Even if there were enough flesh remaining to perform a circumcision, whatever parts were damaged or missing would still make such a man unacceptable according to the Jewish law code. And yet when an Ethiopian eunuch asked Philip, one of Jesus' apostles, what prevents me from being baptized, Philip simply baptized him. There was no debate. Philip didn't go to any governing body. He simply got off of the chariot baptized the eunuch, and went on his way. Long after God had let it be known that circumcision was no longer a requirement for those desiring to do his will, Paul and Barnabas were visiting a group of believers in Antioch, and according to our English translations of the Bible, discovered that it was being taught that circumcision was a requirement for salvation. According to the account, Paul and Barnabas were able to determine that these teachings originated with Pharisees that had become believers. I have been associated with more than one religion that teaches that in the early church, circumcision was a hotly debated issue in every congregation until the apostles finally came together in committee, made a legal decision, and drew up a resolution resulting in the letter that this video is all about. But if we read the Bible for ourselves, it becomes obvious that once the Holy Spirit came down on the crowd at the home of Cornelius, the issue of circumcision was settled forever. There is more than ample evidence that even prior to his death, Jesus was very outspoken about the wickedness of religion and its rituals. Those who followed Jesus while he was alive would have easily come to the conclusion that as the Son of God, he would have had the authority to free his people from bondage to the religious law code. 
For the most part, it was this aspect of Jesus' teachings that drew his followers in the first place. So we have to wonder what chapter 15 of Acts is really all about. As I said at the beginning of this video, any time that a verse seems confusing or out of place or seems to contradict other verses, then likely there is something wrong with the translation. Fortunately, we can look at how this verse was recorded in the original Greek language in which it was written and see for ourselves what is wrong here. We are told at verse 5 that it is the Pharisees that introduced this teaching, but the Bible also says that these Pharisees had become believers. If they were in fact believers, then there is no way that they would have been perpetuating the belief that circumcision was a requirement for salvation. In most English translations of the Bible, Acts chapter 15 and verse 5 says that the Pharisees were saying something similar to this. It is necessary to circumcise them and command them to observe the law of Moses. Most who speak English would understand that this word command represents a very forceful way of communicating instructions to someone. Our word command is only used to describe a higher ranking authority figure giving orders to a subordinate. Unlike suggestions, commands carry the weight of law along with the consequences associated with breaking that law. But the original Greek word that this English word command is translated from, perigeo, is not always translated as command in our English Bibles because in many verses the word command obviously doesn't fit. At 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 17 this word is rarely translated as command but as instruction, directive, announce, or declare. It is obvious that the Pharisees were strongly admonishing the men in the congregation to get circumcised, but there is nothing in this passage to suggest that they were trying to introduce some kind of religious law. Earlier in the account, at verse 1, we're told why getting circumcision, circumcision had once again become an issue. Most English translations render the verse in this manner. Now some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you get circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Early in church history, the Bible was adopted by the religion of the Roman Empire, which was based on the worship of a god of reward and punishment, also known as salvation and condemnation. In our culture, every time that we read words like save, saved or salvation in our English Bibles, we automatically associate that salvation with that everlasting reward. But the word that is used here is the Greek word sozo, which is used in many places outside of the Bible and always translated as save, protect, or rescue, but never associated with any kind of afterlife reward. In fact, this word is never associated with any kind of afterlife reward in the Bible either, but is always used just as it is used in other Greek literature. At Acts chapter 15 and verse 1, the Pharisaic believers were not trying to push some religious agenda. They were in fact conveying their insight as insiders to the Jewish religious hierarchy that the brothers' lives were in danger from the Jews. And Paul took that warning to heart. Just a few verses later at Acts chapter 16 and verse 3, he circumcised his friend Timothy. But prior to circumcising Timothy, a decision was made in regard to the warning given by the Pharisees. As I already said, there was no reason to make any kind of decision as to whether or not believers had to get circumcised. That decision had already been made by God himself much earlier. The problem wasn't in trying to decide whether or not circumcision was required by God, but instead whether or not it was wrong for the brothers to get circumcised. Here's how most of our English Bibles render the brothers' decision into English. Write them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from what is strangled, and from blood. If you notice, this supposed decision in regard to the question of circumcision does not contain any instruction in regard to circumcision. So once again, we're going to have to pay more than the usual attention to this passage 
if we're going to figure out just what's going on here. The first word that we're going to need to understand in this passage is the word abstain, which is translated from the Greek word apikomei, which means literally to stay away. This word does not mean the same thing as do not eat. The Greek word for eat is phago. Apikomei and phago are in no way related linguistically. The reason that I say this is because there are several accounts in the Bible related to the decision recorded in Acts where translators often use the phrase, do not eat. Luke, the writer of this account, was aware of the difference between do not eat and abstain, and used both in his writings where it was appropriate. As I said earlier, when the Jews refused to live by natural law, God gave them hundreds of unnatural laws. In the Jewish law code, there were laws against sexual immorality, a law against worshiping idols, a law not to eat blood, and a law not to eat animals that had been strangled. So many believe that this verse is about throwing out the entire Jewish law code while arbitrarily preserving these four, for the most part, unrelated Jewish laws. The word blood used in this passage can be rendered simply as blood, but it is being used in conjunction with the word niktos, which cannot be translated as strangled animal. This word niktos in Greek can only be translated as non-blood sacrifice, as I said earlier in this video. The fact that the word hamas is being used in conjunction with the word niktos is a strong indication that the older men were not telling the congregation to stay away from blood, but in all likelihood telling them to stay away from the blood sacrifices and the non-blood sacrifices. Any other rendering would make no sense, especially if we take into consideration the other things that the congregations were told to stay away from, polluting themselves with the Edelon and the porneus. The word porneus can have multiple meanings as well, just as the word hama. But once again, the actual meaning can only be determined by the context of the surrounding verses. This word is often translated as sexual immorality, fornication, or adultery. It is where we get our English word pornography. Porneus can mean sexual activity involving two men, sexual activity involving two women, illegal sexual activity between two close relatives, or sexual activity involving humans and animals. Nothing in the surrounding text would indicate that porneus, as used in this particular verse, involves any of those activities. A better understanding of what the apostles and elders were trying to communicate to the congregation can be had if we apply the most common definition of the Greek word porneus within the text of the Bible. This word, as well as other Hebrew and Greek equivalents, are almost always used to describe inappropriate intimacy between humans and fallen angels. In the ancient past, at Genesis chapter 6 and verse 4, we are told that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and afterwards. During that time, the sons of the true God continued to have relations with the daughters of men, and these bore sons to them, the mighty ones of old, the men of fame. From that point on, all intimacy between the fallen angels and humans is referred to as fornication, adultery, or sexual immorality, irregardless of whether or not any sex act is involved. This would include any activity that served the purpose of Satan and his fallen angels. There are many instances of human beings accused of fornication when no sex act is involved, and in each case, those being accused had either participated in religious rituals or formed alliances with nations dedicated to the fallen angels honored by those rituals. So with this information, understanding the context of this verse in question, a much better translation of Acts chapter 15 and verse 20 would be, Therefore, my judgment is that we should not cause problems for those who are not from the nation of Israel, but should write to them to stay away from 
the pollution of the idols, of the religious rituals, and of the non-blood sacrifices, and the blood sacrifices. And yes, in the original Greek, the definite article precedes each of these statements. The word the, before each of these words, would be indicative of the pollution of the temple the religious rituals of the temple, the non-blood sacrifices of the temple, and the blood sacrifices of the temple. Translating these verses in such a way as to make it seem as if they are a restriction against eating blood or accepting blood transfusions is nonsensical at best. But that doesn't mean that those refusing to eat blood or take blood transfusions are stupid or evil. In fact, the very opposite would be true. These verses have been mistranslated by every religion calling itself Christian from the day that the Bible was translated into Latin by the Roman Empire. All Catholic Bibles record that Catholics are not allowed to consume blood. All Protestant Bibles record that Protestants are not allowed to consume blood. So by all rights, anyone that considers themselves to be a member of any so-called Christian religion who mocks or accuses others for their stand against consuming blood needs to reevaluate their own faith. Even if we take into consideration that blood transfusions save lives and that some parents refuse to allow their children to take advantage of such procedures, we have to consider the fact that many have had their health completely destroyed by accepting transfusions and that in our so-called modern day and age, there really isn't any empirical evidence to prove that there is any substantial benefit to most blood therapies when compared to similar alternative therapies. Many deaths attributed to refusal to accept blood transfusions or, in all actuality, exaggerations. Many times, such deaths are caused not by a refusal to accept blood therapy, but instead by ignorance on the part of the doctors involved or blatant refusal to treat patients not accepting blood therapy. The sale of blood, just like the sale of other prescription medications, is insanely profitable. There is nothing wrong with questioning the motivation of medical facilities prescribing things of questionable benefit. The question of the circumcision may not seem to be related to what the apostles and elders put into their letter, but if we take into consideration what was required when an Israelite woman gave birth to her first baby boy, then it becomes obvious just what those first century men were trying to communicate. As followers of Christ, we have been freed from all of the world's covenant laws, whether religious, economic, or governmental, but we are not free from the consequences associated with not abiding by such laws. Paul and Timothy were freed from the law that existed in their day, but as a matter of safety, Timothy decided that it would be in his best interest to simply have a small piece of skin removed from his body in order to keep from being murdered by the Jews, and probably in order to lessen unnecessary distraction caused by Jewish social norms at that time. Paul did the same thing when he shaved his head at the temple. The issue in both cases was not the rights of followers of Jesus to get circumcised or get a haircut. It was whether followers of Jesus could continue to participate in the satanic rituals associated with circumcision and haircuts. The basic principle was spelled out by Paul several times in regard to food. When Paul said that we were free to eat whatever we wanted, but it would not be a good idea to eat things that would be offensive or illegal to those eating with us. Understanding this information has serious implications for us today. In the Bible, much of the information in regard to the sacrifices of Abel Noah, the patriarchs, the Israelites, and Jesus seems to indicate that those sacrifices followed a similar pattern. According to the Bible, the earth-wide sacrifice of Armageddon will take place at the end of a 1,260-day time period, beginning on the vernal equinox and ending three and a half years later on the opposing vernal equinox. If you do the math, you will find that that currently is not possible. 
But I produced a video series a while back called Written in Stone about how cultures around the earth in the ancient past all kept track of time using a 360 day calendar which corresponds to the calendar spoken of in the Bible. This three and a half year cycle seems to correspond to Jesus' ministry, which began when he was baptized and ended three and one half years later on the spring equinox. Since the blood sacrifice of Jesus is compared to Abel's blood sacrifice, it is possible and in fact probable that Abel sacrificed the firstlings of his flock at the fall equinox and was killed by his brother Cain on the spring equinox. When Moses brought Israel out of Egypt, he did so on the spring vernal equinox. After sacrificing the Passover lambs, the Bible records that three new moons occurred before the ritual human sacrifice performed by the Levites. The word that we translate as new moon at this verse is not the same as what we consider a new moon today. In the ancient past, the new moons only took place every 360 days corresponding to the information once again in my written in stone video series. When the apostles and elders wrote to the congregations to abstain from the pollution and abstain from the idolatry and abstain from the religion and abstain from the blood sacrifices and abstain from the non-blood sacrifices, those instructions were for all worshipers of the true God for all time. Currently around the earth, nearly every culture celebrates some kind of spring festival and some kind of fall festival associated with the two vernal equinoxes. In the Western world, those of the Jewish faith celebrate the Passover. Those of conventional Christianity celebrate Easter. Jehovah's Witnesses celebrate the memorial. All of these celebrations are based on the timing of the spring vernal equinox and the new moons. At Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16 and Galatians chapter 4 verses 9 through 11, the Apostle Paul called any celebration of sacred days, especially days corresponding to the timing of the new moons, weak and worthless. I am not aware of any religion practicing blood sacrifices as part of their celebrations of the vernal equinoxes, but we have to question the wisdom of continuing to celebrate any holiday aimed at memorializing such sacrifices from the ancient past. All holidays taking place at the beginning of spring are continuations of the animal and human sacrifices that God hated. If we take this information to heart, we would be wise to put as much distance between ourselves and religion as possible. When the great and fear-inspiring day of the Lord begins, we do not want to be anywhere near any church, temple, mosque, synagogue, or kingdom hall. Speaking of religion as a great city, the Bible begs those of us who love God and love truth to get out of Babylon. When Jesus finally returns to rescue us from civilization, it will not be the blood of sacrificial lambs that prepares the way. It will be the blood of those Babylonians. I decided to produce this video at the request of a former Jehovah's Witness. I have no desire to become the anti-Jehovah's Witness champion, but the question needed to be answered because no one had ever answered it before. At this point, I want to make it perfectly clear that I have no personal agenda. I did not produce this video as a means of justifying an addiction to drinking blood or out of fear that I may one day benefit from a blood transfusion. Although the information in this video exposes a very deeply held belief of the Jehovah's Witness faith, which is not shared by other faiths claiming to be Christian, my desire to expose the lies of Jehovah's Witnesses is not more or less than my desire to expose any of the lies of any of the empire's other religions. Plus, if you take into consideration that every modern language translation of the Bible used by every so-called Christian denomination contains these same exact verses, mistranslated in nearly the same exact way, then it should be more than obvious that this video isn't about exposing 
any one particular sect. Most of those religions continue to participate in their own forms of blood sacrifice. Immediately after commanding the Levites to sacrifice their brothers and sons, Jehovah announced, I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Many of these peoples were exterminated by the Israelites. This unending war, which continues even into our day, was itself a continuation of the ritual human sacrifice conducted by the Levites as they stood before Mount Sinai. The churches actively preach their adherence into participating in this continuation of the ritual human sacrifices. There are special prayers said in honor of the troops participating in the bloodshed. Parents continue to offer up their firstborn by encouraging their children to sign up for military service. Religious people continue to fully participate in the economy requiring more and more resources which can only be obtained through military conquest. No one choosing to use a gas-guzzling luxury vehicle or living in a six-bedroom air-conditioned home can make the claim that they do not approve of carnal warfare. The final sacrifice will take place earthwide. In the Bible at Revelation chapter 16 and verse 16, we're told that this battle will occur at a place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The two words Har and Megadon mean mountain or mountains of crowd or crowds. There is a literal hill in the Holy Land called Megadon, and this may factor in as the starting point for the war. But more likely, the mountain or mountains of crowds would be the earth or the continents of the earth. We can know this. When this final battle is over and the last ritual human sacrifice takes place, there will be mountains of bodies. But if we abstain from religion, our bodies do not have to be part of those mountains. If you don't want to survive, don't listen to me.